That's fantastic. Okay, Cordrick Crumlin. I'm the National Secretary of the Maritime Union of Australia. I'm also the President of the, uh, of the International Transport Workers Federation. I'm also, I guess, International President of the Construction, Forestry, Maritime Mining and Energy Union. So there are certain overlapping responsibilities from each of those areas in this policy area, Senator. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good morning, Senators. Uh, Paul Garrett, I'm the Assistant Secretary of the Sydney Branch of the Maritime Union of Australia. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, Senators. I'm Jason Campbell, the Tasmanian Branch Secretary of the Maritime Union of Australia. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, availing yourself today. Um, now I'm going to go to you, and, and just as a disclaimer, um, these gentlemen are not only comrades of mine, but they're extraordinary close friends, and we have worked extremely close together for many, many years, both in my previous life as an organiser on the waterfront, but more importantly, in improving the lot for Australian seafarers, Australian stevedores and Australian businesses that only flows on to magnificent gains for the Australian population. So if anyone wants to have a crack on Twitter, go for it. There we go. Oh, I'll, 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 hey, Paddy, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, yeah, thanks, mate, and um, I do appreciate the the longevity of the relationship and and the work that you've done on various committees. I remember one very interesting committee with Senator Heffern, and we've had ma very many uh, fellow travellers in that period of time from every political persuasion, and I felt that with your leadership and generally the leadership that this issue um, really has remained uh, central to the interests of all Australians and indeed uh, policy makers. So I, I have to thank you personally for that, Senator, and also everybody that's been part of this long journey with us. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. I guess fundamentally, I've made very many submissions, both publicly and um, uh, within the confines of this uh, uh, legislative process. Cabotage policy remains at the centre, I'll, I'll re, uh, um, uh, enforce that. The cabotage applies to over 100 countries in the world, from all of the European states to North America, South America, I could go through them, places like uh, uh, Mauritius, and we've just seen a terrible environmental disaster in Mauritius. Uh, draw your attention, Honduras, Morocco, Nigeria, the Philippines, China, um, the United States of America, Mexico, Malaysia, Russian Federation, Papua New Guinea, it goes on and on. So it is not the exception to the rule. It is the rule. If you're in a country with a large um, coastline and you rely heavily on domestic supply chain, you need cabotage to protect and develop that industry. And it is very specific to the national economic, political and industrial interests and social interests now under COVID. That's without a doubt. And for some reason in this country, there seems to be a blind spot that it is an essential. We've got one of the largest coastlines on the world. We've got one of the largest economies in the world. And we're the fourth or third largest ship user of shipping in the world. While we still only have a relatively small population of 25 million. This is the axle of economic growth and national security. And um, uh, that's a factual thing, as you know. Um, uh, particularly in US and Canada, Canada is very much like us, large commodity-based country, uh, very big coastline getting, getting longer with global warming and the Northwest Passage. It is more important and identified as more important from a regulatory and legislative point of view. And indeed, you've heard from some of our Canadian and US uh, submissions that have come down here because cabotage is an issue not only of economic security and national security, it's one of human rights. Uh, sustainable shipping policy is what it's about. We've argued continuously in the history of our country is that when we're going back to BHP and iron, uh, or, or the wool. Uh, the movement of coastal cargo has been essential to the economic historical development of this country uh, and very closely um, entwined with industry policy. 
It's no um, mistake or coincidence that it was an area of bipartisan political support right up to the 90s when the Howard government actively dismantled the cabotage provisions and attacked the industry as part of the overall political framework, industrial framework of, um, of attacking the Maritime Union in Stevedoring. And a lot of the damage was done. They undertook in those days to replace it with something superior um, to enhance it. They identified in their own terms that it was essential to Australian economic and security protection, but nothing was ever done about it. Um, in that time, we've seen industry policies collapse in steel, in aluminium, in many other areas. We no longer make cars. So the decline of cabotage is also closely identified with the decline of, of Australian industries, um, but yet it is still put as the forefront of a response to COVID that if we are going to continue to develop economically and be able to meet the very high standards that we've become used to in this country, we need strong supply chains and strong uh, industry policy um, uh, to be working again. And that includes in tourism and some of our submissions go to the cruise ship industry, the whole drama, a national disgrace for all of us that we can't, well, we've got one of the biggest hydrocarbon and gas reserves in the world, more gas than Qatar, uh, the largest in the world, that we can't manage our industry policy in the way that develops uh, many of the industries that need the developing. And that's without, you know, folding in all of the, the new opportunities that I know Professor Garner um, uh, referred to earlier, say hydrogen, if we want to be at the front of industry policy, we've also got to be at the front of supply chain. You can't develop an, an ability to regenerate the wealth, you know, in the infrastructures that are required if you don't control and up monitor and regulate your domestic supply chain. We've seen uh, um, the collapse of the wisdom of long-term shipping where Australian ship owners were able to bring down overall freight rate costs by maintaining the maximum number of ships in ballast and be able to move backwards and forwards, replaced by what is basically a failed mechanism of temporary licences that the last speakers had identified that is really just a laissez-faire, free as you go. There's no control over maritime crew visas, and you're going to hear more, more about that. There's something like 350,000 maritime crew visas being issued. There is absolutely no scrutiny of them. They're going for $10,000 each on the black market. They are a traded commodity on the black market because they know they go without any regulation. And these are fraudulent use of MCVs. If you want to go and then have a look at some of the MCVs of people coming in and out of the country, I know there's a piece of legislation before the Senate now, but for the lower house and the Senate, that identifies things like the Maritime Security um, uh, Maritime uh, Security Card and parallel, as you know, with the Aviation Card. So Australian seafarers are being put through a scrutiny and, and a filter you know, of the most extraordinary time. And you add the administrative costs, the regulatory costs, the bureaucratic costs. Whereas an MCV, all of these people that are basically moving cargoes full time in the domestic trade come under no scrutiny whatsoever. It's a travesty because it is dangerous and it belies the fact that risk mitigation lies at the heart of good governance in this country today. While that happens, it doesn't. And to extend it to the aviation industry, when we have this great opportunity and we're seeing the complete bureaucratic failure uh, during COVID, and there'll be more from the ITF on that tomorrow, I understand, Senator, Senator, to be able to not identify this has been a chronic political and bureaucratic um, um, uh, failure, is to be in denial at a negligent level. When your committee and the other COVID committees and the other uh, the inquiry into AMSAR, for example, that identified chronic weaknesses, AMSAR has become just a political arm of this government. It is no longer seen to be an independent. It never identifies even, 
you know, the maintenance of, of these these crews that have been kept on on ships for up to 14 months. EMSAR was said the other day, well, that's just the minimum and it may go longer. Wage slavery is going on out there and incarceration is going on out there and temporary licences and the blind eye that's been set to that is right at the heart of that negligence. And I would suggest to you, if it wasn't the government, almost criminal negligence because uh, there, is, there is much organised crime. This is the critical area of security for us and we don't know what's going on. Uh, secure investment, we want to have secure investment. We're committed to ongoing labour reform. We've reduced our crews down to some of the smallest in the world. We've multi-skilled them. But there needs to be a fiscal framework, Senator or Senators, uh, so that, that people can um, invest with surety. The intention of the original Act on TLs was that they would only be awarded to people investing in Australian shipping. Sure, we need flexibility. We need it in cruise ships. But the exception shouldn't be the rule. The rule is an Australian industry protected from exploitation, protected from tax evasion, protected from wage slavery, protected from the holes of security. We've identified for many years, and it's just a risk, but uh, ammonium nitrate is one of the largest cargoes shipped between Australian ports. Most of the time, Australian regulators don't know where it is or where it's at. So this negligence transforms itself over a long period of time into a blindness because all they're doing is rationalising an industry predicated upon tax evasion in ships that cannot be regulated and where there could be no security checking. So there are fundamental flaws. Some of it is strategic that we're addressing. We need to rebuild our fuel security and we need to be part of that transition to new forms of energy development and right at the leading end. And we're out there as part of that debate. And shipping is part about that debate. If you're going to be innovative, if we're genuinely going to use what's going for us, we've got plenty of wind and sun, we've got a fair bit of hydrogen and a fair bit of that gets burned up in the centre along with other, with other forms of oxygen, Senator. But we need to put it to great, you know, we need to put it to absolutely, you know, the direct. We need to be leaders. And you can't rely on bludging on a failed international model for shipping and then hate the high moral ground that we're about a new normal in this country. It's a conceit, it's nonsense, and it's negligent. And we need to have a, a proper review into, into where that's going. And I mean, we're, we're happy and, and you've been obliged us by bringing people from the US and Norway and Canada and New Zealand to be able to identify, take the spin out, identify what has to be done. And that's critical to what's, uh, um, what's going on. And I mentioned uh, Canadian Canada on the way through there. So the, the other thing, of course, is um, the Maritime Labor Convention. I spent, and as young as I look, you wouldn't believe it, uh, Senator, you know, I spent nearly 25 years at the ILO putting a Maritime Labor Convention um, um, uh, into practice from the leadership of the international seafarers, partly as president of the ITF, that we have an enforceable code that is supposed to protect seafarers in an industry where wage slavery and wage exploitation is right. You know, I, I relied on port state control and everybody's asleep at the wheel of AMSA. There is absolutely nothing to the MLC except lip service. Temporary licences aren't overseen. The ombudsman isn't there to be seen. And at my last incursion, if I can put it that way, or engagement with one of the committees here, it had been identified that the ombudsman, the Department of Transport and Infrastructure, whatever they call themselves these days, AMSA, nobody knows what's going on. There's no forensic approach to the awarding of that. They don't know the pay that's being paid. So we want a total review of, of the maritime crew visas. It's an exception, not a rule. 
that hasn't got an entitlement. They're here, including in cruise ships. They never go away. All that it is is basically we're, we're drawing and sucking out the marrow of an industry that has been corrupted internationally. So we see ships like what's happened in Mauritius. We're seeing this collapse of what it means. We're seeing cruise ships where people lie systemically because they know the regulators ashore will not catch them at their lives. Does anyone believe that there's no COVID aboard these ships coming in and out of Australia? Of course, that's nonsense when you see the levels overseas. What's happening, Senator, is that those ships aren't declaring and no one, no one has the resources, the gumption or the political will to go out there and expose what's going on. So, of course, we're some other COVID cluster waiting to break out at any time. And, it, and there's nothing good about COVID, nothing good. But what it has starkly demonstrated was the abrogation of the responsibility of regulation of our critical industry of shipping by both state and particularly federal regulators and the great danger and risk that it's exposed all Australians to, not only uh, currently in health, but also in security in the longer run and, and the economy. So finally, Senator, the, um, I'd just like to say, look, I, I feel a bit, you know, like, um, you know, the, the wailing wall, you know, in Jerusalem, when you pray and pray for a better world, you know, and, and you know, it, it is very central that area with, with to both Muslims and um, and of course to to, to Jewish and uh, to be able to hope and to work. Well, I'm a bit like feel like the wailing wall here in Australia, but it's not a wailing wall, Senator. All I'm doing is bashing my head against a steel wall or a brick wall, and it's time. And thank you again for your leadership. It's time that the pandemic you know, firstly, becomes the punctuation of how ill-prepared we are and how negligent the consistency of poor leadership has been in this country, not only the detriment of those seafarers, where one in eight died in the Second World War, where we relied on industry building, Black Jack McEwen, it was bipartisan for generations after generations that COVID has given us the opportunity for us as a nation to go back and redevelop our shipping industry around best practice, about productivity, about best security, about sustainability and development. And in that post-COVID recovery phase, um, uh, Senator, our economic, social and political future is central to taking back the coastal supply chain crewing our blue highway with Australian seafarers and ensuring an island nation has, a, has the merchant shipping fleet that, that guarantees peace and prosperity and security going forward, just as it's done for generation after generation after generation uh, since white occupation of this country. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.